Welcome everyone and thank you for attending. Uh, this is the third webinar in the NSAFE Client Education Series. My name is Rich Heinzenberger. I'm a project manager here at NSAFE. And today's webinar topic is all about the emerging contaminant PFAS. And it is being presented by Adam Weissman. Uh, Adam is a professional engineer and senior compliance specialist who works out of the NSAFE office in Wethersfield, Connecticut. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Thanks, everyone. Uh, appreciate everyone uh, taking a little time out of their day today. I think this is a uh, an interesting subject and uh, good material, and I hope folks uh, get some uh, takeaway from it. So uh, with that, uh, we'll get started. And uh, as Rich uh, introduced me, um, I work uh, with NSAFE out of the Connecticut office, uh, primarily uh, doing uh, compliance work, a uh, lot of air permitting and wastewater treatment, et cetera. Uh, chemical engineer by background and have been in uh, manufacturing uh, for uh, the bulk of my career and have been uh, involved with uh, PFAS now for a couple of years. And uh, I think you'll see uh, from this presentation today that uh, it, is, uh, it is a subject that uh, really has some uh, broad uh, implications uh, and it's certainly uh, an emerging uh, topic that's uh, worth uh, at least giving some thought to. I would hope that's one of the takeaways today that you'll see some of these pieces being uh, connected. So uh, I want to sort of, you know, this is a standard slide in a presentation, you know, some of the things we'll be covering uh, during the talk. Uh, and my challenge here is obviously to, uh, you know, try to reach you with, uh, you know, the right amount of information and not go too in depth. Uh, I guess I'll apologize up front. Um, some of the slides I'll move uh, kind of quickly through, um, but I feel like, um, you know, you, you certainly can access the materials afterwards. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of interaction with the group, uh, as Rich indicated. So uh, sort of let's get started. Um, and I want to at least touch on, you know, what, what is PFAS? Uh, what is the context here? You know, what is the chemistry? So I, I think for folks on, you know, certainly on today, you know, people have heard about PFAS. Uh, one of the uh, takeaways that's interesting is, uh, you have no uh, universally accepted definition of uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, so it's a it's a family of molecules, and I'll, I'm going to share a little bit more about that. And basically, these are uh, chains of uh, carbon atoms where uh, fluorine has been substituted for the hydrogen constituents. Uh, and uh, we have quite a bit of uh, a, a family of molecules. And that is one of the actual challenges related to uh, PFAS, that we don't have uh, an individual chemical that we're talking about. You will often hear discussion of PFOA and PFAS, uh, and you can see some of those chemical uh, uh, molecules are shown here on the slide. Uh, you're basically talking about uh, thousands of uh, chemical uh, compounds. You've heard the term uh, that these are forever chemicals. The uh, carbon fluorine bond does not want to break down. It is typically not naturally occurring. Uh, you also have a, uh, from, a, from a chemical perspective, you have a, a hydrophilic or water loving head on one end of the molecule and a hydrophobic or water hating tail on the other end of the molecule. And that is uh, certainly uh, relevant. It, it, it is what gives the uh, the family of molecules, its properties, and, and, and the reasons that it was used so widely. A uh, very unique uh, chemical group. Uh, they're very soluble, uh, and they're mobile in the environment, and these are all uh, challenges uh, as we uh, go through the slides today, you'll see. Um, not a new uh, chemical. Uh, these have been around uh, since uh, as early as the 30s and 40s. It wasn't really until um, the 1950s that these started to become more uh, prevalent and being rolled out uh, into uh, the consumer marketplace. Everyone's heard of a Teflon uh, frying pan and folks probably may still have them at home. Uh, Non-stick coatings, water resistance and stain resistant coatings. And so really in the 1960s, 
uh, these things started to roll out in that respect. And you can see as we are today in the 2020s and after 2000, there was certainly some uh, indication of we should be paying a lot more attention to these things. But one of the things I guess that's interesting on the slide is that the health concerns uh, took place as early as the 1970s. So where can we expect to find these PFAS uh, family of, of, of molecules, PFAS chemicals? Well, uh, you know, to summarize, everywhere. Um, these have been used in uh, paper and packaging. They've been used on clothing, carpets. Uh, if you're an outdoors person like myself, uh, clothing uh, to keep it uh, more water resistant, ski clothing, ski waxes, adhesives, pesticides, medical products, personal care. So these things really, because of the uh, anti-stain and waterproof uh, you know, uh, attributes of these molecules, uh, they were they were uh, commercially uh, really well utilized. And so that's, uh, you know, sort of another issue that these things really were, were just sort of put on everything. Um, so, you know, as we roll forward, EPA uh, did a uh, multi-industry PFAS study 2021. They were looking at point source categories, trying to quantify PFAS data in wastewaters, um, trying to see, uh, you know, were there specific industrial categories that were using PFAS chemicals? Uh, could there be specific industrial facilities that were discharging PFAS in their wastewater types and concentrations, et cetera? And um, conclusions of this study, uh, which is uh, interesting is that you know that they are these 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 molecules are present in wastewaters from these five uh, target industries uh, pulp and paper uh, i'll talk about that a little bit more um, and some of the challenges of eliminating and reducing some of these materials uh, electroplating uh, that's another challenge uh, electroplaters uh, use these as uh, suppressants for uh, mist and for uh, when they're using chrome plating. So as they are suppressing mist, which is obviously applying the chemistry to uh, reduce environmental impact of the chrome plating. Now the next challenge becomes the PFAS being indicated in the uh, in the wastewater. This was kind of interesting um, and I, it may be a little tough to see on the slide, but it, 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 it again, it just shows you how broad the uh, use of these chemicals are. And uh, this was a study uh, from a GLUG study, uh, which we reviewed as far as our reference materials uh, by the uh, Royal Chemical Society. It was hundreds of pages, large number of industries, and they were trying to understand, you know, where this material was being used. And again, we really can see from a, 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 a slide like this that we can really expect to find them almost anywhere. Uh, musical instruments, greases, construction materials. Uh, it's just very interesting. Fingerprint development, pesticides. Um, so it's really uh, quite amazing to see that this is a very, very broad uh, industrial application. Interesting that uh, you know, we actually have some folks on the uh, call today who are really just sort of beginning their process to understand PFAS. We obviously have a group in the middle that are showing that they certainly have awareness of the subject. I think a lot of folks do. Uh, and then uh, less less so folks uh, putting themselves in the highly aware of uh, PFAS and sh issues and information. So uh, that uh, I think we might have expected results sort of like this, but it's interesting to see uh, as we poll and that, you know, it, it, it helps me understand uh, the folks that we're talking to today. We've, we've seen these kind of slides before, and I'm, I'm including this in, in, today's, uh, in today's presentation. Um, you know, this is your typical uh, showing how this material can transfer from industry, from an AFFF foam, uh, through consumer products, through the environment, and to uh, human exposure. And uh, unfortunately, that, that certainly does have significance. Um, and there's been uh, quite a bit of review of some of these uh, 
materials as far as uh, human exposure is concerned. Um, and here's uh, again a, a slide that is often typical in these types of presentations showing part of the uh, food chain and these are uh, one of the challenges with the PFAS chemistry. It's highly water soluble. It bioaccumulates. Um, it uh, there's some studies now that indicating that the PFAS with the shorter carbon change of, of fewer than eight carbons are more toxic to invertebrates. Um, so, you know, we're already seeing fish studies uh, and we're seeing, in fact, some uh, fish uh, avoidance uh, occurring in several states, as we have seen with other chemicals like PCBs, et cetera. Um, here's a, a, a similar slide, but showing some of the uh, transport uh, and exposure pathways for human and wildlife. And so as these materials can find themselves in groundwater, um, from uh, use on land surface, they can be surface transported, uh, they can be picked up uh, both in wet and dry deposition, and they can be oxidized in the atmosphere so they can change uh, in terms of the uh, molecular chain length uh, so they can break down. Uh, so that's another challenge. So we have a chemical that can uh, start off as one molecule but then transform into another uh, slight variation. Uh, there could be different behaviors and volatility, et cetera. So uh, a, a complex uh, pathway. And you can see some of these impacts uh, to uh, wildlife and the impacts are being found uh, globally and uh, it is uh, of concern, obviously. And, and as I think people on this call probably have heard, uh, PFAS is uh, and can be found in uh, human blood. Uh, and there have been some studies uh, related to that to see what is uh, exposure and what is background uh, look like related to this material. So, I, I, you know, as I've sort of said, and I think it's obvious, uh, you know, these are complex issues. Um, there are some niche uh, issues in uh, it within PFAS. Again, it's it's a large group of molecules. Uh, and as we get into the rest of the presentation, I think you're going to see that there's a lot of data gaps. We, we don't know all the answers and you're going to see that there's quite a bit of regulatory and pending impacts taking place uh, regarding this material. So what I'd like to do is uh, get into a, lo a little bit on some regulatory developments. And again, apologizing in advance, we'll, we'll kind of move through these quickly, but I think it'll give folks a feel for um you know for these developments and and sort of what's what's occurring in the backdrop as this is becoming a a much more uh regulatory relevant uh subject matter um so this is an important uh document that the epa released in october of 2021 this uh, pfas uh, strategic roadmap and um it was initially focused on uh, the PFOA and PFOS, but uh, certainly it it looks like that the EPA is, and certainly is moving to regulate these class or subclasses. Um, and uh, it really uh, walks through a timeline of actions which are already underway. Um, a big focus uh, had been at um, drinking water contamination. Certainly that is a, a very important focus. But you'll see as we walk through these slides the connection between the industrial user and um, the uh, air and land based pollutions. So here just as we walk through individual regulatory programs and again I'm just going to keep these relatively brief uh, regarding individual regulatory programs which is the you know the core of the compliance type activities that I'm sure a lot of folks on this call deal with. Um, one huge challenge, which, which hasn't really happened yet, and it, it would be a tremendous challenge, um, you know, if these chemistries, PFO or PFOS, were designated as hazardous substances, hazardous waste, um, which has not occurred yet, but there's, there's folks looking at this, um, and this could really impact uh, waste management, obviously investigation, remediation of contaminated sites, we're already doing some of this work uh, with contaminated sites, 
um, but it is uh, there. There is a challenge, and could it, it could reopen closed sites? So this really could be a, a big deal. Um, and these regulations are uh, still being uh, hammered out. And there's plenty of folks who have a vested interest in uh, where this where this will fall. Uh, on the drinking water side, which is probably getting the most attention, and where folks have probably seen the most in terms of uh, focus on the news, et cetera, and is a significant concern because of the daily exposure uh, to drinking water and also for uh, young uh, folks having their entire life exposure to these materials. Um, and what's really amazing here to me as an engineer and as doing work in this field, you know, some of these low levels are just to the point of they really can't be duplicated in the laboratory screening. Uh, there's been new health advisories, in fact, that just came out, which are effectively below minimum reporting levels for labs, uh, for PFOA, 0 0.004 parts per trillion, PFAS, 0 0.002 parts per trillion. These are just staggeringly low levels. Uh, Connecticut has some has adopted some levels. Uh, 16 parts per trillion for PFOA, 10 parts per trillion for PFAS. The, there's, there's been announcements of uh, additional funding available. There are fact sheets on uh, several of uh, uh, EPA website, as well as often uh, if you go to some of your state uh, Department of Health websites. And it, it really is a challenge to understand, um, you know, what these levels actually mean and what exposure actually means at these levels. Um, and so th this also is is somewhat of a moving target. Um, for a lot of our clients and for clients on this call today, the discharge of this PFAS material um, is going to be uh, a challenge. So as we see uh, effluent guidelines developing and as we see that uh, the multi-sector, multi-industry PFAS study, emphasis on NIPTES dischargers, emphasis on effluent limitations. Uh, you're going to see movement in the wastewater sector. Um, so, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but it, 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 there's a real challenge here of treating these materials. They're really not amenable very well to treatment. And so if you're in an industry that is a, a user of these materials, uh, involved with uh, fibers or paper or uh, possibly uh, metal finishing, uh, this could be a, absolutely a, a future challenge that you're going to have to be considering, including even landfills. Um, the Clean Water Act uh, was certainly has been, you know, the primary mechanism for uh, controlling uh, discharges to receiving waters. Um, and we have clients uh, uh, who obviously have NIPTES permits who treat their water. They have to sample, as folks on this call know, they have discharge monitoring reports. They send their samples to the lab on a regular basis. Um, if we are seeing and will be seeing PFAS being written into these uh, permits and into these uh, sampling uh, protocol, that is going to be a challenge and that is going to be something that um, if these wastewaters contain PFAS, and this could include stormwater discharges, uh, understanding you know what 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 EPA methods and analytical methods to use, um, you know understanding what those numbers are, and and then getting into you know how are we treating them, uh, how are we reducing them, uh, and it's it's a challenge because these chemicals don't really lend themselves well to uh, standard treatment methodologies like oxidation or chemical precipitation. Uh, switching to the air side, um, it's not uh, currently a listed. Uh, and one of the things I guess I would say here is uh, there's been, and this is a, again showing you the sort of connection between these issues and the different uh, media streams. Uh, for example, uh, what hazardous waste incinerators are traditionally applied uh, to uh, hazardous waste for destruction, as we know, and uh, certainly 
a, a go to typically would be for a hazardous waste to be incinerated at high temperature. But now we're looking at possible guidance and questions being asked at the, the uh, struct destruction efficiency with a PFAS chemical. So, I mean, can uh, in fact, can it even be destroyed? And if uh, if you do put it in an incinerator, you know, what kind of uh, downwind uh, contamination are you causing? Are you uh, what kind of uh, efficiency of destruction are you seeing? So uh, I think the air side is 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 certainly not immune to this issue. Uh, Tosca, uh, Toxic Substances Control Act, um, is really one of the gates that the EPA uses to uh, to prevent chemistry from coming into the United States uh, that potentially has human health concerns that are not understood to identify and track. And now, you know, PFAS is being included, um, and these these will be challenges. In fact, um, there are even challenges because um, folks may not even be realizing that these materials are being imported or produced by them. Um, there's been uh, folks looking at even as they, uh, for example, HDPE containers. There was uh, there was a uh, EPA EPA in March uh, 2022 sent out uh, an information request or information to uh, manufacturers, importers, processors, um, and it was discussing the uh, fluoridated HDPE containers, and they were identifying that the mechanism of using fluorine as a coating and actually reacting with nitrogen forms some of these chemicals and molecules. And so that here's even an example of a container lining or a container coating where folks were creating this molecule. So uh, very interesting. Uh, TRI, we do a lot of TRI reporting. Um, it's been it's been a listed. Uh, since uh, 2020 reporting it was updated again in 21 updated again in 22 so the the epa will obviously be gay gathering and is already gathering information regarding you know who is uh, releasing this material 100 pound threshold um so if you're obviously a tri reporter uh this is something that you need to put on your radar screen and uh you know they have de minimis levels uh pfoa is at 0.1 percent uh, the other PFAS is at a de minimis of one one percent, um, so it's it's a challenge, especially with uh, some of the available data that folks use to produce a TRI report. Uh, involves safety data sheets, which may or may not include um, you know this this information. So, I think to summarize uh, the regulatory developments, it's a moving target. More regulations are to come. Uh, there's been several acts uh, to accelerate this. There was actually some additional news regarding this uh, PFAS Action Act that recently in the news. Um, and again, the reduced, uh, you know, exposure recommendations and guidelines. So, you know, I think one of the takeaways is maybe summarized on the bottom of this slide. You know, this traditionally was considered an AFFF foam problem. So if I'm not using AFFF foam, if I'm not a, a firefighting department, if I'm not a uh, aviation facility, uh, or maybe this is an investigation remediation problem, I, I think you're starting to understand that this is, is way beyond that and uh, certainly could have significant effects to businesses who are either using these compounds, possibly even forming these compounds, and even more of a challenge or may may not even have full awareness that they're even uh, using the compounds. It's interesting. I these are always fun and it's always interesting to see which word sort of wins out, if that's the right term. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing the word persistent and everywhere, which I, I certainly mentioned a few times, ubiquitous. Yes, these chemicals are literally being transported around the world. Um, and uh, I see uh, several of these challenging, uh, fuzzy, uh, you know, moving target, vague, uh, undefined. Seems to have a, a few folks chime in on that. So I think that it that it that those are those are valid uh, responses. In that uh, this really is a moving target, and uh, that is one of the challenges. As even this message is delivered by the regulator 
regulators, to the regulated community, to the public at large. Um, you know, if we have a material that's everywhere and that's undefined. So let's just go and I'm going to do these are going to be uh, very brief, just a few slides here. We, we actually had quite a bit of material on the health impacts, which I, I'm not really getting into in, in depth here. So here's some uh, again, folks have probably seen slides of similar nature. Um, so this is primarily uh, an ingestion inhalation uh, issue. The most common uh, exposure route would be the ingestion of PFAS uh, in water. And um, that's a challenge because obviously it's also being used as a coating for manufacturing of, uh, of uh, food containers. And we've already discussed the uh, solubility in water. And I think this is a, uh, this is a good one. Uh, research suggests that it might be harmful. And I, I think this is one of these um you know i like to use the term and, and this is a term that has that i didn't come up with but it's been being used you know it's best avoided um there's there's study after study uh this you know it's summing it up pretty well uh it can cause uh cancer uh it's been implicated in uh th thyroid function issues liver function issues immune system issues reproduction issues um, there's a challenge in establishing uh, reference values of exposure. Uh, so, you know, even if we're trying to understand uh, exposure, you know, what is a what is a what is a reference value? What kind of exposure is the person already being and already have been exposed to, uh, just from just being, uh, you know, in 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 society? Um, and here's just one more on the uh, health uh, side. Uh, not a traditional dose response model. Um, and this uh, small amount, you know, is, is, is increases the body burden. It doesn't get excreted very well. Uh, not all the uh, responses are well defined. And obviously the, you know, the, the million dollar question, at what point does the body burden result in response? Um, and, and a lot of this is still being developed. Uh, you know, when you have a bio accumulative material, uh and you know there's a lot of toxicological research that's uh taking place and 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 even to the point that there are different dose response curves for uh, the long ch chain molecules versus the short ch chain molecules uh so it's a pretty complex uh understanding of the uh body burden and response and folks can certainly um reach out for uh, a lot of information and again uh on the, the you know we're not really getting into very deep on the industrial hygiene side but uh you're going to see uh more occurring on the industrial hygiene side also so um you know we're we're moving we're moving through some of the materials and i want to talk a little bit about um the uh environmental impacts and then we can talk um, a little bit about uh, some of the industry impacts. As I've been talking about already, um, certainly the focus continues with and has been to date a large focus on um, drinking water. And obviously drinking water is a significant uh, issue in protecting uh, human health. And we're seeing, as I've already spoke about, you know, very, very low numbers being suggested for uh, drinking water. Um, you're also going to see uh, a shift as they try to get ahead of that drinking water issue by looking and applying effluent guidelines. So obviously uh, we're going to be looking at effluent guidelines and as they traditionally do with NIPTES permitting and effluent guidelines, the regulatory consideration of ecological receptors. So Obviously, you're discharging to a river, you're discharging to surface body, discharging to groundwater. You know, what are those uh, receptors? Um, and, you know, this gets into obviously uh, potential for remediation, site investigations, toxicological impact studies, uh, could affect uh, stormwater uh, discharges. And uh, I, again, this is a, 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 it, it's ongoing and developing. And the bottom, I think, is 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 worth looking at. The bottom bullet. Um, these echo effects are going to directly Im implicate uh, 
industrial discharges. They're obviously going to want to go upstream and protect the environment and human health by looking at those industrial discharges. Here's a slide that I think um, is, is, is also developing in terms of its data. Uh, this was just, I thought it was interesting to share, um, showing folks what kind of sites we've seen to date contaminated. Um, this information, you can see the source there, but look at landfills and military sources accounting for half. But what I think is maybe also interesting is you see fire departments and training areas accounting for 2%. Um, that may be accurate, but it may not be accurate. It may not be accurate because this information is still developing. These fire department training are often municipal, local fire departments. They could be uh, could be an industrial fire department, but they're often local and municipal. And these are just starting to be understood and realized. And the sort of sad part of all this is that in many cases, you know, these local fire departments and training areas were using a triple F foam um, and, uh, you know, they were uh, really just using it right out back, so to speak. And uh, in fact, it even was possibly inviting other folks to participate in these training exercises so that even though they had the a triple F and really weren't possibly even using it that often during an actual fire event, they were possibly training with it annually, resulting in some discharge or contamination and possibly uh, water source contamination. And you can see the industrial sources there are 22%. So I thought this was interesting. Um, not going to talk about much of investigation and remediation challenges, but it, it really is um, sort of the same message. You know, um, the use and history of the material is and can be unclear where it was used, how it was released. We have rapidly changing guidance. We have rapidly changing methods of uh, measuring the contamination, rapidly changing lab analytical methodologies, um, a lot of debate as to what the methodologies should even be. Can they be verified? Toxicology is still being studied and understood. Uh, you know, I already mentioned rapidly changing screening levels, which seem to be only moving in one direction, which is down and lower and looking at lower and lower screening levels and the remediation methods still emerging there really is um the, there will need to be work um to understand you know what what can we do with this material and and even if we're like you know the old traditional dig it up or something is you know where, where is this material going and how is it being treated as i said incineration may not be highly amenable to uh to this material so um they're not new chemicals uh, we're understanding for the first time their fate and transport um it uh certainly is incomplete um and uh the uh you know we really only studied a small fraction of this family of chemicals so that's another challenge uh and it it, it you know a lot of learning to do and as you can as you can read this this, this slide yourselves um very interesting and very challenging from a technological perspective understanding the impacts of long versus short chain molecules, the impacts to am I talking about an animal? Am I talking about fresh water, salt water? Um, what, what, what am I looking at? One size certainly does not fit all. And uh, there's uh, quite a varied group of, of, of people who are doing this kind of work. And uh, so we have a lot of information still being developed. And what I wanted to talk with these uh, this last group of slides is um, some of the industry impacts and some of the, I think, for folks on this call, you know, and our clients, in many cases, our industrial clients, um, what is the, uh, you know, what is sort of some of this takeaway and what are some of the impacts that are certainly worth at a bare minimum giving some thought. So this is sort of, uh, we've said some of these things already uh, earlier. You know, we have a rapidly unfolding regulatory frame framework. Um, we have a very difficult uh, to treat family of molecules. For me, as a chemical engineer, um, you know, traditionally, um, you know, you apply uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, you uh, neutralize something. You oxidize something. You precipitate something. And again, these are uh, uh, very much uh, not always amenable to uh, this PFAS chemistry. It could be absorbed on carbon, for example, but 
So you're just sort of moving the material from one media to the other. Uh, as we indicated, it's a uh, it's a bioaccumulator. Uh, it, it's poorly excreted. It's water soluble. So to me, this 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 is kind of a, a perfect storm in terms of this molecule and uh, the properties of this molecule. Um, from my perspective and having worked with manufacturing operations uh, for, for decades, um, th these are interesting uh, challenges and questions. So, you know, for instance, uh, something as simple as uh, a customer or a client uh, is asking for a certification. Hey, I want to make sure you guys don't use PFAS. Uh, can you give me uh, that certification? Um, normally, that would seem like a, a fairly straightforward uh, question, but it's a challenge here. How should you respond? Are you sure you know the answer to this question? Uh, it should be a simple question, but uh, unfortunately here in this case, it's, it's probably not so simple. And you need to start to understand that these kind of questions and concerns are beginning, they're coming, they're already here. Um, we've already spoke about the EPA strategic uh, roadmap. We have spoke about effluent guidelines and safe Drinking Water Act, uh, numbers, TRI, public awareness. So for me, I think um, the phase out clock is ticking. I think you'll see as we, I present the next few slides that full phase out may not really be practical here, but I think folks who are using these molecules or potentially using these molecules definitely need to be thinking about these things. Um, so if you are uh, an industrial, uh, user, client, manufacturing process, you know, do you have it? Where is it in your plant? Um, these are materials that are uh, always, well, not always, but typically found as, I'm sorry, as uh, coatings um, or as uh, additives. Uh, they could be in, in very, very small uh, quantities. They may not be fully uh, available to you on um, safety data sheets. You know, as I spoke about treating and discharging it is 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 difficult and can become problematic as uh, these limits get developed. So a lack of a full understanding and, you know, asking yourself what steps can I take and do I need to face this um, and what responsibilities may I have as a result of this. Uh, and it's these unique properties that were the reason that we're seeing it everywhere and continue to see it. It's a, it's an amazing uh, product. Uh, the AFFF foam was just one example of a, of a firefighting material that had tremendous properties for uh, hydrocarbon fiber fires um, and, and the ability to smother those fires. Um, but, you know, this can alter the electrical potential, it can reduce corrosion. This uh, is a fantastic wetting agent. So anyone who wanted better rinsing, better wetting, better cleaning, it was used in plating. Uh, there was certainly what I would view as a lot of non-essential uses, but I think now we need to start thinking as a collective group, uh, what are my essential uses versus non-essential? Where is it easy to eliminate? Um, the last bullet's interesting to me uh, chemically. It's a, you know, this can reduce surface water tension to half of what's available on a hydrocarbon. So if you have a hydrocarbon based uh, ability to reduce the surface water tension. This can do twice as good. And, you know, again, it's it was really used for that reason. I mean, really made things uh, clean and good wetting and good rinsing, good water break, et cetera, for anyone in the uh, plating industry. Uh, also used for for, uh, for emissions suppression. Uh, right. And, and, and again, these are the kind of industries and it's it's quite broad. Um, we have uh, we have, in fact, we have folks in um, in uh, the paper industry that was supporting in uh, textile. We certainly do work in aviation. Um, it was used in construction products. So you're even dealing with uh, folks who are post consumer and uh, and there you go. It can impact not only the uh, public drinking water, but an an a landfill or airport. So, you know, these were these were uh, these were chemicals that really were key to our uh, recreational activities and gear you know, key to lifestyle, used for cooking, hunting gear, um, just just really interesting and very broad uh, use of these materials um, in, in everything from even coating uh, guitar strings to make them nice and slippery, uh, water treatment and wood industries and leather industries and automotive and apparel. So it's just, it really is a much broader application than a lot of folks 
may give an initial thought to. It's often not so obvious that you're using this material. And in fact, um, what's what's important is that you really are potentially starting to work with your supply base and starting to work with your supply chain to ask the right kind of questions and to drill down and to think about those chemicals and those secondary chemicals that you are using in your facility. You know, think about coatings and defoamers and anti-stick compounds, waterproofing materials. Um, you know, take a look at safety data sheets. Look for the, you know, for fluoridated type materials. Um, I'm not initially suggesting that you do any sampling to look for this, um, but you know that that could be considered. You certainly want to understand why you're doing the sampling and and what are you going to do with the results. Um, it could be a proprietary ingredient. It could be an inert ingredient. It could be certainly listed as less than 1%. So um, th this is part of the challenge, you know, and then if you're using this thing because of a customer specification, if you're a military supplier or dealing with a Boeing or Pratt spec, then certainly, um, you know, you're challenged if this is a requirement to use. And again, as I indicated, uh, get into some detailed discussions with your suppliers, with their technical staff, understand to the, get to the right person when you're asking these questions um, and start to really understand, um, you know, do I have a potential uh, use of this material? Do I have a potential impact? As I said, I think we're going to see um, discharge limitations. Um, we're already potentially seeing that with we have a client dealing with a, a washing process and uh, and was de and is dealing with some of this uh, difficult to treat. Uh, better to be eliminated, um, but don't be caught completely short if you're being asked all of a sudden to uh, test for this in a permit and then find that you have this in your discharge and it's you really would like to be a little ahead of that curve before that happens. I think one of the you know interesting things about this kind of a question is, uh, you know, at, at one takeaway, I think for a lot of people, including myself, you know, it was really viewed as an AFFF kind of a question. And um, I think as I'm presenting this information and, and folks who are aware of this subject previous to today's uh, discussions, um, this thing, uh, it certainly could impact my business. And even here's a couple now indicating it's posing a significant uh, risk to my business. Interesting. Uh, and then even th and the smallest group, uh, not relevant to my business, no need to worry about it. So uh, we find that the uh, respondents here, that's the smallest group who feel it is a really not an issue for me. I think we'll give it another minute. I was surprised to hear you say that it's used as a coating on guitar strings. There you go. <laughs> hey, if you're a guitar player, you don't you know you don't want your you, you want a nice slippery guitar string. I mean, uh, sure, it prevents corrosion. I mean, it had all kinds of great properties. Used on camping gear, hiking boots, ski ski equipment, all kinds of hunting gear, medical implantable devices. Some amazing properties. There's a comment coming in used on a lot of things we take for granted. That's exactly right. And we're going to have to be accepting possibly as a society a lower performance attribute with some of these materials. Um, that that'll be part of the challenge and takeaway. And I'll present these last few slides and I think you'll see there is some good news. I'm going to try to present maybe not as much doom and gloom, but uh, interesting. So uh, the, the number one, it, it could impact my business and I certainly should start thinking about it as well as folks thinking it really is significant risk. So very interesting. So here, here's an old uh, an old message, and I and I took this right off the Connecticut uh, DEP uh, website. Just the standard definition of pollution prevention, uh, eliminating toxicity prior to generation, right prior to treatment. Um, so emphasize minimization rather than control. And I think there is, uh, as much as this is not a new uh, message, I think in light of the uh, characteristics of PFAS, the difficulty of treatment, the bioaccumulation, the forever molecule, um, I think we are best minimizing versus control once generated. Um, in the aerospace side, which a lot of our clients, we do a lot of 
aerospace work. I've done aerospace work in my career. Um, you know, aerospace is about performance, corrosion protection. Things need to be very stable. These things need to be lubricated. They need to be uh, something that they can rely on. Um, it improves bath life for alkaline etching, uh, which is a fairly nasty process. I already mentioned about surface tension on plating, and that surface tension and wetting is very important. Uh, there are actually uh, fluoropolymer coatings that can be put on on metals to provide uh, coating and lubricity. So uh, very, uh, very much used in the aerospace industry. Um, here's one that I think is sort of a, a little bit scary and, 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 and I think possibly a good news story as as awareness is now coming into the marketplace. Um, people don't give a lot of thought traditionally to uh, paper and uh, food packaging and uh, you know, it's just sort of a one use, one time use in many cases, but these coatings are uh, very sophisticated and they prevent uh, grease and uh, water from migrating through the coating. And also, obviously, when you are doing food packaging, this package is the only thing the consumer sees if you have a frozen food, for instance. And so this is a big deal. And we're now starting to see these bans legislatively taking effect. Um, Quite a few states are, are chiming in on this. Seven states. Um, there's a there's a PFAC, PFAS Act for food, and there's even discussion now about using a, a total organic fluoride test, which is a very much of a broad brush type testing versus looking for individual molecules. And as I said before, I think the good news here is that as folks are aware, and as the consumer is aware, and as the manufacturers are aware, we can accept possibly. Uh, reduce performance, but stop using these materials for uh, food packaging. Uh, go back to possibly more traditional wax type uh, uh, materials that don't contain PFAS and can pretty much accomplish the same thing. Um, here's a niche industry. I am a skier, but this industry, this particularly affected for the most part cross country skiing and these fluorinated waxes obviously were great. They were very slippery. Uh, the skiers like them. Obviously, if you're a, a professional cross-country skier, Mike, a few seconds of time is very, very important. But the takeaway here is that the companies that are making these waxes recognize this is an issue. In one case, they were unfortunately fined by the EPA, but they're, they, they came back out with a uh, public education program, responsible waxing, and you know they're able to ban these uh, waxes use random testing to confirm compliance. And as long as everyone's competing on the same fair level and not using these materials, then we certainly can ban them and, and, and certainly uh, can still have our skiing and ski competitions without the use of these materials, as an example. Um, here's just uh, an example of something very different than ski waxes in terms of its mission criticality. Um, this was the gold standard and remains the gold standard. Uh, for uh, fighting uh, liquid hydrocarbon fires. Um, it, it snuffs out the fire. It, it, it does quite a few things as far as putting a blanket over the fire and preventing oxygen. It really it, it did. It was an amazing performance. Um, so, you know, you need to now understand, you know, are you using these? Can you use a non fluorinated uh, replacement? Uh, could it, you know, and, and it gets into questions. Is it compatible with your existing equipment? Could you use uh, the next gen material, which are lesser fluorinated and are uh, well originally being presented as much better for the environment, but uh, now this challenge is to say they may not be so much better. Um, and even the simple question are, are you using it? How can you tell? Uh, and as I indicated, and not just with AFFF, may or may not be listed in a safety data sheet. Um, you possibly want to be asking the manufacturer to provide analytical information to demonstrate the content, uh, possible use of a fluorine free uh, foam as a pollution prevention evaluation may or may not be possible with your specifications, may or may not be possible under certain uh, conditions and for certain types of aviation facilities. And, um, you know, it's not a simple task to substitute, right? So these are, you know, some some basic questions. Could the substitute work in my system? Would it meet my specifications? What requirements are requiring me to use the material? What kind of replacement equipment do I need? Do I need to train people on how to use the new equipment? Do I have a legacy process or material? And, and this isn't just with you know firefighting foams. I mean, I think this 
could take place with anyone who's using these materials and to take um, you know a serious look at okay if we're going to stop using this you know what what is what is that really going to look like uh, and as I indicated with my slide a, a few minutes ago, I like the concept of traditional pollution prevention here. Uh, where are you using it? If you have a critical application, could you isolate the waste stream? Could you isolate where you're using it? Could you certainly eliminate it if you have a non-critical application? I spoke about that. Um, and again, this, this is, you know, really getting ahead of this is, is probably one of our best tools uh, as opposed to dealing with it after the fact. Um, and from a chemical engineer perspective, um, and for folks who have been involved in wastewater treatment, uh, difficult treatment in the water phase, um, really not like cyanide or heavy metals, which could be oxidized, can be precipitated, can be dropped out as a sludge. Um, and so this is uh, unfortunately has limited to treatment options. Um, if you contaminate uh, secondary media, like a filter or sludge, a resin, et cetera, you know, you're going to need to consider uh, those things. Um, now they need to be handled. Um, and in incineration, which is typically a go to, I mentioned is uh, being viewed as not that effective regarding this material. There is some plant based biofiltration. I actually read an article about showing some promise, uh, but this is again, you know, these plants absorbing um, the material. So you are effectively moving from one uh, media to another. So as we get into our last couple of slides here to uh, to think about, I mean, I, I would hope that this is at least some of the takeaways that people took um, today. Um, you know, the do nothing now plan is probably a not, a, not, not great. Uh, the head in the sand, this doesn't affect me, um, is probably not your best approach. Uh, and I hope today's awareness uh, some folks are seeing that. Work with your suppliers, trust but verify, stay abreast of regulatory developments, especially within your regulatory uh, area, as well as your manufacturing area, as well as the industry you're in. So if you're in a specific industry, stay abreast of the information being provided by your industry groups. Um, keep your management and process engineering teams informed. Understand your exposures and liabilities maybe make some plans, uh, put some finances uh, on paper. You know, again, it, 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 this is a great time to start to understand some of these good questions. Uh, you know, if you get questions from a customer, you know, how are you gonna react? How are they gonna react? If a ban takes place in your industry, how fast can you react? And I think that's some of our, um, you know, wrap up here. And uh, here's some takeaways that I hope folks are taking uh, with them today. Um, they are unfortunately every, everywhere. Uh, they're environmentally persistent. They're complex. We're seeing major regulatory changes, both pending as well as already happening. Um, we're going to see effluent discharge limitations. Uh, even though these are not new chemicals, I think for the first time we're starting to see a lot more traction, a lot more information, um, a lot more ecological data. Um, and we're going to need and we're going to see accelerated research. You're seeing the federal government put funding into some additional research and studies. So more gathering of information. Um, and as I indicated, I think pollution prevention and waste minimization processes could be some of our best tools. Um, starting to think and plan certainly is a tool. Um, and I think over the next few years, you're going to see quite a bit more uh, rolling out regarding this uh, this subject matter. So, you know, Stay calm, stay informed, monitor information, uh, <laughs> yeah, sift through the avalanche of information, tough, but um, it's, it, it, it's a challenge. Um, and uh, if you don't know, you can ask, and uh, we're certainly one of the folks you can ask, but there's a lot of, lot of good information out there. Uh, EPA has information, health department information, individual state information, um, number of different references and sites and i recommend you you know sort to take a look at uh at all of these things don't 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 rely on one one place to get your information great great job adam and thank you very much thank you to everybody who uh, joined us today and that concludes our presentation thank you everyone really appreciate everyone's time today